Stanley Jones, a great author and missionary to India for many years, described the kingdom of God this way. The kingdom of God is God's total answer for mankind's total need. The Lord's Prayer teaches us to pray, thy kingdom come, asking God for his kingdom to come in our lives. What is the kingdom of God? What does it mean to pray, your kingdom come? The word kingdom simply means the rule or the governance of God. We talk about different types of government. God is portrayed in the scripture as the king of the universe. His law is our word. So the kingdom of God is where God governs, where God rules. The psalmist put it this way when he talked about the kingdom of God. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Psalm 103, 19, his government, his power, his sovereignty, his watchfulness, his provision, his protection. God rules over everything in the universe, but more importantly, where we live in this world. When we live in the kingdom of God, we are living under the king's rule and governance. It is in that place where we enjoy the blessings of the kingdom, which is why he said the kingdom of God is God's total answer for all of our needs. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 6 and 33, seek first the kingdom of God, the rule of God, the governance of God in your life, and his righteousness, which righteousness is the standard of life in the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. All the other things in life that we need. And he was talking there to his disciples about their worries and their concerns for their provisions and for their needs. He said, well, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, if you'll live in the kingdom and live under the rule of the king, everything else in life will be given to you. Seek first the kingdom and everything else in your life will come into proper order. The theme of the kingdom of God is the essential message of Jesus. The phrase the kingdom of God appears 67 times and the kingdom of heaven 33 times in the gospels of the New Testament. And these two terms are used interchangeably. Now, sometimes you may read that the kingdom of God means one thing and the kingdom of heaven, something else. That's not true. The, the terms are used interchangeably in the Gospels. Matthew, for example, prefers the kingdom of heaven because of his perspective and connecting heaven and earth. Luke, for example, and Mark will talk more about the kingdom of God, but it's the same thing. So there's nearly a hundred references right there of the kingdom of God just in the gospels. We're always hearing Jesus talk about the kingdom and how to give it, get in the kingdom and how to live in the kingdom. And here he teaches us to pray, Father, your kingdom come. So what does it mean to pray this simple phrase, your kingdom come? What kind of prayer is this? What's the impact of it? What does it mean? Well, first of all, your kingdom come is a personal prayer. It's a prayer that I can pray as an individual that you can pray as an individual. Father, let your kingdom come in my life. Let your rule be established in my life. Lord, I want to live obedient to you. I want to live by your laws, by your word. I want to be righteous because that's the standard of life in the kingdom. The kingdom of this world is a kingdom of unrighteousness and conflict, but the kingdom of God is a kingdom of righteousness and peace. You see, we're born again into the kingdom. That's how you get in the kingdom of God. You're born again through faith in Jesus. Jesus told Nicodemus the Pharisee this very truth in John chapter 3, verse 3 through 8. Nicodemus the Pharisee, a great man of influence, came to see Jesus one night to talk about spiritual matters. And here the gospel of John tells us that Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again unless a man or woman is born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he tells him later, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And it is through the new birth when we are born again through faith in Jesus, we experience a spiritual change in our hearts. So when Jesus talked about how you get in this kingdom, you don't work your way into the kingdom. You certainly don't force your way into the kingdom. You don't earn your way into the kingdom through self-righteousness, through religious obligations, through keeping some type of ritualism. It's when you put your faith in Jesus and receive him as Lord, as King. 
suddenly you now are born again into the kingdom of God. And when we become Christians, we experience a kingdom transfer. You know, when people come from one nation to another, they come on a visa. But if they want to become a citizen, then they transfer their citizenship. They get a new citizenship. And Paul the Apostle uses that kind of a comparison when we are born again through faith in Jesus. We come out of the kingdom of the world under the dominance of the world, under the control of evil. And we're now transferred into the kingdom of God. So we're in a new kingdom, living by new rules, experiencing the blessings of grace. Sometimes people will flee a nation, a kingdom, because of war and strife and poverty. And they want to go to a better land, a better nation. They want to become citizens of a healthy nation, a prosperous nation. Well, that's exactly what it means to become a Christian, to come out of this world of poverty, of sin, of guilt, of judgment, of fear, of conflict, and to come into the kingdom of God under the rule of Jesus as Lord. Colossians 1 and 13, Paul tells us that God rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. So when you're born again through faith, God rescues you out of this kingdom of darkness and brings you into the kingdom of Christ. In Philippians 3.20, he says, our citizenship is in heaven. Regardless of what national citizenship we may have, our greater citizenship is in heaven. So this prayer, your kingdom come, that really begins when you receive Jesus as Lord. You were born into the kingdom. You've transferred out of the kingdom of the world. You're not controlled by the forces of this world. And it also means that we are praying to live a kingdom life that honors the king. We just don't want to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. We want to be a good citizen. In Romans 14, 17, Paul said that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, what he means by the phrase eating and drinking, he was at the time talking to believers in that church that had different opinions about which foods they should eat and so forth, the way that people have different opinions about a lot of things, a lot of customs. But he said the kingdom of God is not a matter of human customs, your diet, your fashion. The kingdom of God is about bigger things. The kingdom of God is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so when we pray, your kingdom come, we're really praying about God's rule in our lives. We're praying, Lord, I want to be righteous. I want to do the right thing. Help me to grow in righteousness. I want to be a person of peace. The word says, blessed are the peacemakers. I want to live at peace. I want to let go of all the resentment I have and difficulties or conflict. I want to live in peace. And Lord, I want to be a peacemaker. And joy, it's praying for joy. Lord, help me to find my joy in you. You're going through depression or sadness to give that to the Lord, to cast your anxieties upon him, to live a kingdom life, to be a good citizen of the kingdom. So the prayer, your kingdom come, starts with us. When I pray it, when you pray it, it's a personal prayer. Lord, I praise you that I'm in your kingdom. When you pray your first prayer to say, Lord, forgive me my sins, I receive it as my savior. You're really praying your kingdom come in me, I receive you as my savior. But it's also praying about the way that we're living. Lord, I want to live righteously. I want to live in peace. I want to live in joy. I want to be a, an example of you to others. Well, second of all, this is not only a personal prayer. It's a prophetic prayer. There is something prophetic about saying, Lord, your kingdom come. It's a prayer of expectation of the Lord's return because we are in the kingdom today spiritually. But the Bible talks about Christ is coming again. And when he comes, he's entitled King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so there is in this prayer an expectation of the second coming of Christ. There's an expectation. And so when we pray your kingdom come, we are reminding ourselves of the ultimate goal and outcome of history, which is the return of Christ. We look at world conditions, and they can be difficult at times. And every generation goes to a world of conflict in its own way. And yet in the midst of all that goes on in the world and politics and so forth, we realize that the ultimate goal of history 
is the return of Christ. And so this is a prayer of expectation, reminding ourselves and reminding others of the final chapter of history. The book of Revelation ends with a personal message of Jesus to us. It reads, he, that is Jesus, who testifies to these things, says, yes, I am coming soon. You see, that's a personal promise of Jesus to us. I am coming soon. And John the Apostle, on behalf of all of us, says, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with God's people. That's how the book of Revelation ends. The entire Bible ends with Jesus saying, I am coming soon. And John responds the way that we should all respond. Amen, Lord, I believe that. I expect that. Come, Lord Jesus, that's the same prayer. Thy kingdom come, Lord, return in all of your power and your glory. So when we pray, your kingdom come, it's a prayer of expectation on our part so that we live with hope looking for the Lord's return. It's also a prayer of preparation. If the Lord were to return today, I want to be ready, and I know you want to be ready. I want to be prepared as I can be. The best way to be prepared is to have Christ in your heart. But we want to live in a way that honors and glorifies Him, as John said in 1 John 2 and 28, so that we will not be ashamed at His coming. So when we pray, your kingdom come, we're really praying for ourselves. Lord, I want to be prepared to meet you. I want to be ready to meet you today. I want to do my best for you. And Jesus talked about His second coming in His teaching right before he went to the cross. He gave prophetic signs of world conditions. But he made this challenge to us in Matthew 24, verses 42 and 44. Jesus said, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So when we pray your kingdom come, it's prophetic. We're reminding ourselves of the ultimate goal of history, where it's all headed, the return of Christ. We're also praying every day that we would live a life that's prepared to meet him, being watchful and ready when he returns. For thought of all, this is a very powerful prayer. It's a powerful prayer to pray for others. It's an intercessory prayer. Lord, your kingdom come to the members of my family. Your kingdom come to the people I work with. Your kingdom come to the people I work out with at the gym. Your kingdom come, Lord, to our nation in need of revival. In that sense, your kingdom come is an intercessory prayer for God to break into our world with power and glory. First Corinthians 4.20 says the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And when we pray for the kingdom to come, we are praying for an inbreaking of God's spirit. In Mark chapter 9, verse 1 and following, Jesus said that some who are standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come. And many people thought, what does that mean? We know the kingdom of God coming is our personal salvation. We know the kingdom of God coming is the second coming. But what did he mean that there were, there were people right there listening to him today that would not die until they saw the kingdom of God come? And he said to come with power and glory. He wasn't talking about a second coming. He was talking about the way the kingdom would come in the world in his crucifixion, the power of God in bringing atonement. He was talking about the kingdom of God coming in the world in his resurrection. What a demonstration of the power of the kingdom. A great earthquake that morning. The stone was rolled away. That was so big, no one could have ever rolled that stone away, and yet it was moved. He was also talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost when the power of the Spirit came upon the disciples. They spoke with those heavenly languages and the church was born. You see, the kingdom of God coming is not just prophetic. It also those times that God breaks into our world with miracle grace and revival. And so when we pray your kingdom come, we're really praying for a revival in our generation. The most important thing Jesus said about the kingdom, the greatest truth he ever established is found in Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. Once when having been asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Your kingdom come is a prayer for the kingdom of God to be within us, not just in salvation, 
The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the kingdom of God coming in power. When you're praying for people in need, you're praying for the power of God to be demonstrated. Just as Jesus prayed for his disciples, we can pray for our family and friends that the kingdom of God will reside within them. We can also pray and work for the kingdoms of this world to submit to the rule of Christ. I love this passage in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 15, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever, amen. Pray for the kingdom of God to come to your family. Pray for the kingdom of God to come to the people you're working with. Pray for the kingdom of God to come in all the kingdoms of this world, the kingdom of the media, the kingdom of politics, the kingdom of economics the kingdom of education, that have become the kingdoms of this world. Many times they're corrupt, they're misguided, they're in a kingdom of darkness. Pray for revival, for the power of God to come in our generation. Let's join together for prayer. Father, today we humbly pray your kingdom come in our lives, in our family, and in this nation and in this world. Show us your power and your glory in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining me. Do me a favor. Would you subscribe to my social media so you and I can stay connected? And also subscribe to the Mount Perrin social media so that you can experience all the great ministries of the church and participate in the ministries of the church. I want to thank you for your gracious support of the ministry, for your financial support, for your prayers, and all that you're doing to serve in the ministries of the church and, and the way that you're helping our outreaches here in Atlanta to people in need and helping us to support missionaries all over the world. Your support is appreciated. God sees it, God will reward it, and God will bless you for it. Sunday's coming. I'm looking forward to seeing your family in church this Sunday. God bless you. Have a great day.